Should I start? Yes, yes please. Yes, Anil Bhai. All right. Right, now um, the theme of uh, my uh, talk today is uh, socialism and the Indian, and the legacy of the Indian freedom movement. And the reason why I thought of speaking on this subject is that uh, for some time it has been obvious that there are groups of uh, political groups in India who train their attack on the present day Congress. But what we sometimes miss is that they, their real attack is on the entire legacy of the Indian freedom movement. And the entire notion of um, India uh, that was fostered uh, from the late 19th century onwards. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes. We can hear you. Yeah. So uh, now um, in that context, as the Congress has successively weakened as a political party, the question before the socialists who parted company from the Congress in 1948 is about their responsibility to defend and safeguard the legacy of the Indian freedom movement with which their own history is closely entwined. Now, um, I believe that uh, socialists need to pay greater attention to this aspect of the question. But before I come to uh, that, um, the whole question of uh, defending the notion of India as uh, was formulated from 1885 onwards, um, let me approach it through another angle. Uh, what are the sources of Indian socialism um, that we adhere to or we um, recognize uh, as uh, something that we uh, relate to? Now, ordinarily, if you speak to socialists, they uh, define their history from 1934 onwards, when the Congress Socialist Party uh, came into being within the Indian National Congress. But, um, and they tend to stop there. But, it is necessary to go back a little further. Uh, for instance, <clears throat> they do recognize that in 1931, the Bihar Socialist Party was formed. Uh, Professor Abdul Bari, the great trade unionist and freedom fighter and non-cooperationist was one of the leading figures in that formation. And he was part of the Congress Socialist Party that came into being in 1934. So it go, the story certainly extends back at least to 1931. But it goes back still further. If you look at the discourse on Indian uh, democratic socialism within India, uh, the name of Dadabhai Naroji comes to the fore, for instance. In 1904, he attended the International Socialist Congress at Amsterdam from 14th August to 20th August, 1904. And he was received there 
At that conference, there were people like Rosa Luxemburg and others. And he was re received there as representing the people of British India. The resolution passed there referred to the issues that Dadabai Nauruji had been raising, uh, to the draining of resources of the people which had caused impoverishment. And the resolution called upon the workers of Great Britain to enforce upon their government the abandonment of the dishonorable system of administration and the establishment of self-government. And in his speech at the Amsterdam Congress, the International Socialist Congress in 1904, Dadamai said that the hope and remedy to the problem, the economic and political problem of India, lay in the hands of the working classes. Now, that's a very important statement which Dadabhai Naroji made uh, as far back as 1904. And as socialists, we have to hearken to it. And he interestingly defined working men. Of course, uh, the expression used was working men in those days. Uh, he defined working men as constituting the immense majority of the people of India. Now that is an interesting definition of uh, the working class, which uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, as I see it, the correct way to understand working classes. Uh, corrected, of course, to include women uh, in men or vice versa. And this resolution was carried in Amsterdam without opposition. The fact that Dadabhai had associated himself with the socialists uh, at the socialist conference in Amsterdam in 1904 was criticized uh, very severely in the colonial press. So um, this is uh, how far back we can directly go, if not further. And today, to save time, I will not go back further on this aspect, but then there is another um, aspect which, uh, to which socialists can relate in India, and that is Dada Bhai's inquiries into poverty. The whole question of the poverty of India was brought to the forefront by the writings of Dada Bhai Naroji. And it is that tradition which is reflected in the uh, freedom movement um, throughout when there are inquiries uh, conducted uh, into situ famine situations or if the crop fails uh, in a certain taluk in Gujarat or in a certain district in Gujarat, the elaborate inquiries that were sponsored by the Indian freedom movement um, to uh, uh, to relieve the distress of the uh, peasants. That entire tradition we can relate to. And uh, Bardoli, <coughs> the Bardoli struggle of the late 1920s was also connected with this uh, whole issue of agrarian distress, which uh, in India, is a very contemporary and live issue today. <coughs> then again, uh, centralizing the issue of the poverty of India as, uh, as the issue on which um, the entire uh, focus of the uh, people, thinking classes, was to be uh, trained was uh, continued uh, in various committees that were set up by um, uh, in the provinces. For instance, in UP, there was the Agrarian Distress Committee uh, in uh, the turn of the decade, the end of the 1920s. 
and uh, <clears throat> I will I will come to that if there is time. Then um, <clears throat> uh, the, the issues concerning the peasantry were brought to the forefront by uh, Gandhiji at Champaran, uh, and so on. So these are uh, issues that uh, we we can easily relate to, and we must not allow ourselves to forget. And this is a legacy of the Indian freedom movement, which uh, I think is a precious one for us. Uh, you know, when the <coughs> uh, when the um, agrarian distress committee was set up in the United Provinces, it set up various subcommittees and Acharya Narendra Dev, uh, who presided over the founding convention of the Congress Socialist Party in 1934, was already in 1930-31, a member of these uh, in further inquiry committees, for instance, the inquiry committee that was set up to uh, look into what happened uh, in the uh, Gorakhpur and Basti districts after the Gandhi Avin Pact. And uh, they produced reports which, uh, we, which were widely quoted, and uh, they exposed uh, police and administrative connivance in the reign of the zamindars and uh, their illegal exactions. So this whole land struggle, this whole agrarian distress question is something which the Swiss uh, relate to, and it goes back far beyond the actual formal um, establishment of the Congress Socialist Party. Uh, similarly, as I said, if you look at uh, the resolutions that were passed after, Champ <coughs> after Champara, uh, the session of the Indian National Congress in 1919, uh, where Motilal Nehru presided, in his, um, in his, um, uh, presidential speech, Motila Nehru makes very important points, uh, some of which I think we can uh, directly relate to. For instance, uh, his, uh, the way he deals with this whole issue of, uh, of uh, uh, Kisans. So he addresses specifically in the midst of his lecture, he says to the Kisan delegates present here, I am glad to see in there who, uh, I'll repeat this, to the Kisan delegates present here, who I am glad to see in their hundreds, who represent the great agricultural proletariat of this country, and to the labor delegates, this Congress owes a special duty. We have to see to their enfranchisement and to the improvement of their hard conditions of life. <clears throat> so, just mark these words, the great agricultural proletariat of this country and to the labor delegates, this Congress owes a special duty. We have to see to their enfranchisement and to the improvement of their hard conditions of life. <clears throat> so now this is something which um, goes to the heart of the uh, socialist ideology. And the very expression that Motila uses in this 1919 uh, presidential speech, the great agricultural proletariat of this country. Now, in this, in this expression is uh, hidden uh, something quite uh, remarkable, which uh, he, in a way, he anticipates the change that Ma Mao Tse Tung brought about in Marxist theory in China. That is uh, referring to the peasantry as a vanguard of the revolution. So here in 1919, Motilal Nehru is referring to the agricultural proletariat. Now it's, it's I think, a remarkable expression. And we certainly uh, must uh, heed it and pay attention to it that this is a commitment which was made uh, at the 1919 session at Amritsar after, after all the atrocities in Jallianwala Bagh, Gujarawala, and elsewhere in that year. 
And this is a solemn commitment to which we relate and to which we stand committed. So uh, the point I'm making is that our uh, formal organizational history may start in 1934, but our history of ideas, our ideological history, our uh, um, history of our struggles starts well before 1934. And uh, <clears throat> when Dada Bhai himself, when he comes to um, India uh, and uh, presides over the 1906 Calcutta session, of the Congress, he speaks of Swaraj. Um, and he speaks of it from the Congress platform, uh, the podium, and the Congress becomes committed to the whole question of Swaraj. So um, this speech, by the way, at that session, Acharya Narendra Dev is present at the Calcutta session in 1906. And this speech inspired many who uh, hearkened to it repeatedly. For instance, um, um, uh, 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 Acharya Narendra Dev, and uh, even I think Motilal Hiru uh, was inspired by that speech and, and referred to it. And even later socialists, even socialists who I knew in my lifetime, like uh, uh, Bij Mohan Tufan, <laughs> the famous Delhi socialist, in his uh, work, he refers to how reading Dada Bhai Naroji he understood the whole question uh, of Indian poverty and its origins. So these are things that uh, we uh, must remember. And then again, there is another aspect to what um, Motilal Hiru says in 1919 in his speech at the Amritsar session. Another, um, he's criticizing the Reform Act, which has just been passed. And he says another, unsatisfactory feature of this act is the attitude shown towards the enfranchisement of the mass masses and the wage earning classes. The joint committee have limited the total number of people enfranchised to about 1.5% of the population. Mr. Montegu welcomed trade unionism in India, but added that industrial labor had as yet attained a very small development. He did not choose to tell us how India's industrial development had been obstructed by the British Indian government, nor did he refer to the 80% of our people who depend on agriculture. And then again, he asks for female suffrage in the same speech. A feature of the act which has disappointed me much is the failure to do justice to the political rights of Indian women. I had hoped that Parliament would profit by the lesson of the women's suffrage agitation in England, but they have repeated the mistake of the Franchise Committee. The justice of the claim was recognized, and the flimsiest of, flimsiest of arguments were advanced in favor of delay. I trust that Indian men will come to the rescue of their sisters and hasten the day of their enfranchisement. So here again, <clears throat> on uh, matters concerning industrial labor, as well as matters concerning women as a whole. Uh, there are issues with which, um, which, go, which uh, form the heart of uh, socialist ideology as well. <clears throat> and these are commitments which are made uh, by um, the mainstream Indian national movement. Then again, um, <clears throat> on labor, now, you know, in a few weeks, it will be the centenary of the Nagpur Congress of 1920. Now, uh, Nagpur Congress had uh, passed a resolution on labor rights. Uh, and I will just try to read out to you what that resolution was. This is December 1920. It's going to be next month, 100 years since the Nagpur Congress. This is the famous Congress at which 
the resolution for non non violent non cooperation was agreed to and uh, non cooperation became such a mighty movement thereafter um, <clears throat> the resolution i just read that this congress is of opinion that indian labor should be organized with a view to improve and promote their well being and to secure to them their just rights and also to prevent the exploitation one of indian labor two of indian resources by foreign agencies and that the all india congress committee <coughs> excuse me should appoint <coughs> a committee to take effective steps in that behalf so this is a resolution passed 100 years ago which directly uh, speaks to uh, the socialists and their movements and their causes <coughs> so then i'll now move on to other aspects you know <coughs> excuse me <laughs> uh, this um, uh, in the course of the movement we have parted company from various uh, groups and uh, persons um, post independence minu masani left the socialists and uh, joined up with the swatantra party but even uh, <coughs> even when he had uh, uh, been part of the movement he defended and he, and even later after that he defended the uh, right to strike uh, that's a very important point because he says his main difference with the communists uh, was and arose because he felt that in the soviet union <coughs> they had not guaranteed the right to strike so he says that uh, this is when he's this, this is when he is writing in his swatantra and post swatantra phase that is after independence and he says he considers the right to strike vital in fact he argues that one of the reasons for his disillusionment with the soviet union was that the rights of labor were not being adequately safeguarded there so this uh, is something that uh, is recognized even by a person like minu masani in his post socialist way and uh, it is something that is a legacy of our entire struggle uh, which goes back more than 100 years so um, i think uh, this is uh, this relates to a very important aspect of uh, our indian national movement which we cannot neglect then let me come to some other i should mention of course that a number of our socialists like professor abdul bari of jamshedpur <coughs> and mohammad hanif of urissa and shibnath banerji <coughs> and malti choudhury of urissa these people these iconic figures were all uh, persons who were organizing both uh, peasants and uh, the working class both peasants and workers and they are doing this well before the formation of the uh, socialist uh, the the formal organization their activities are part of the pre socialist many of them like professor abdul bari he was a non cooperationist mohammad hanif he was <coughs> educated at uh, also a non cooperationist he was educated at kashi vidyapeet now all these people form part of the mainstream national movement and they are also part in due course of the socialist movement <coughs> with which so our our whole history is entwined is intertwined with the 
cases like this. I've just named a few. Uh, then let me come to this whole question of civil and democratic rights. <coughs> now, you know, this is a tradition which goes back uh, a long way. Um, we had, uh, during the freedom movement, whenever there were incidents of firing or of abuse of power <coughs> by authority, this was inquired into uh, by the national movement and its organizations. Committees would be set up. Inquiry committees would be set up. They would go and give very comprehensive reports. Now, the one about Punjab is well known in 1919. Within a year, in less than a year of uh, the events of April 1919, a committee headed by a committee comprising uh, Mutilal Nehru, Abbas Tayyabji, <clears throat> um, Siyak Das, and um, with K. Santanam, uh, M. R. Jekar, is, and Gandhiji as members, they produced a report in less than a year of the incidents. And it's a comprehensive report in two volumes. And the second volume is, um, it consists of about 600 statements and affidavits taken individually by members of the committee. You know, each member of the committee was, was assigned a particular city or area. And uh, in their presence, these statements were taken and sifted and checked for veracity. And 600 of them were published in volume two. And volume one is the analysis which the committee made. Uh, it went into everything in great detail. It did not exaggerate. And it uh, <clears throat> produced a report which uh, laid out principles of how a state should behave and is expected to behave towards its citizens. So it's, it's, a, it's a very vital report which reverberates through history, which, which, uh, which we can relate to today. Uh, similarly, there was a report <coughs> when there was firing in the course of the non-cooperation movement in Dharwar in the South. Abbas, the, the uh, committee was appointed, headed by Abbas Tehbji, to inquire into that firing. That, again, is a very comprehensive report. He, Abbas Tehbji goes into the evidence. He was a judge in Baroda, you know. He was chief justice of the Baroda High Court at one point before he joined the non-cooperation movement. And he uh, produced a very comprehensive report on Dharwar. Similarly, Peshawar, when, in 1930, when uh, the firings and other incidents took place in the course of the civil disobedience movement in 1930. That was inquired into uh, by a committee, Vithalbhai Patel, Asif Ali, and others. And they produced a very comprehensive report. Then, of course, there are already the uh, agrarian reports, which I mentioned. There are reports, uh, you know, in all provinces, and there are reports of uh, inquiries into particular taluks and districts about revenue, uh, the condition, the capacity of the peasants to pay in a given year, and the economic condition in particular areas. So there is a whole set of uh, entire legacy of the freedom movement, fact-based inquiries uh, and, judge, uh, and conclusions, rational, reasoned conclusions. And this is a whole uh, heritage that we have. And this goes on post-independence when um, uh, Dr. Loya also uh, is part of it, when uh, he uh, takes up civil rights questions in Manipur and elsewhere. <coughs> and uh, Acharya Narendra also, in spite of other differences they have by this time. But on these, qu on these questions, Acharya Narendra Dev actually uh, supports him. And... Um, <coughs> says that these are uh, issues that uh, the uh, socialist movement uh, would uh, focus on and which it considers crucial. So, for instance, when uh, Dr. Loya is arrested under the Special Powers Act of 1932, uh, Narendra Dev is in Austria and issues a statement in his support. And uh, when Loya takes up the Farooq Habat peasants' agitation in 1954, <clears throat> uh, he has the backing of uh, Acharya Narendra Dev. And uh, Manipur in 1955, 
and so on. So um, these are uh, this is an important legacy, which again of civil civil of upholding civil and democratic rights, which uh, is entire is uh, something we can relate to, and uh, which is vital to the uh, whole socialist legacy. Then <clears throat> there is uh, there are further questions relating to uh, representation. Uh, for instance, it's when it starts this um, in the late 19th century, when the national movement starts talking about representation in the civil services. People like uh, uh, Naroji, Ranade, and others are taking up these issues. And then again, in our own time, we find that in civil service, and before I come to our own time, in the 1920s, when Fazli Hussein is in the Punjab government, early 1920s. And he readjusts the representation of the various communities in the Punjab civil service. There is, in fact, a statement by Gandhiji in which he, uh, he uh, approves of it. And he says, he approves of it by saying that uh, it was, an, it, it was, uh, sort of a legitimate uh, reorganization of the civil services, readjustment, I think is the word that he used, of the proportions in the civil services. And uh, there was, uh, he seems to support what Fazli Hussain did in Punjab. <clears throat> Similarly, in our own time, we had uh, agitations over, uh, we had, uh, Kapuri Thakur, and then we had those agitations later on over Mandan. So these issues also go back a long time. And uh, that whole controversy also goes back in the South, in uh, you know, the reservations which preceded the ones in the North. <clears throat> so that is another aspect which is uh, some entwined with our current uh, history and also with socialist politics post-independence. Then again, I'd like to refer to the aspect of uh, <clears throat> economic democracy. Now, in, you know, um, <clears throat> we had figures like uh, Senapati Bapat and Gajanan Kanitkar in Maharashtra, who were very early, in 19, as, as early as between 1921, 1923, uh, struggling for reasonable compensation from corporates like the Tata Power Company for farmers whose land was being acquired by them. Now, this is something, incidentally, which Gandhiji supported the Mul Malshi uh, Satyagraha. And uh, <clears throat> it is something which which is a live issue in our time. And we, we can relate to it. Now, interestingly, these very two figures, who, one of whom, Senapati Bapat, was associated with the socialist tradition more closely. N.G. Gore, uh, later on, writing in the Congress Socialist, <coughs> in. Uh, on 14th May 1938, he referred to them. And he referred to them in a very uh, interesting context. There had been a May Day march in 1938. This is about, might say, about 15 years after the Mulchi Satyagraha. And in that May Day march, the people like Senapati Bapat and Kanitkar, Gajanan Kanitkar, were attacked, assaulted. And who assaulted them? According to um, N.G. Gore's article, it is the Hindu Mahasabhaites and the Hedgevar boys who did this. So I'll just quote what N.G. Gore wrote in the issue of the Congress Socialist on 14th May 1938. said, who attacked the May Day procession? Who assaulted men like Senapati Bapat 
and Gajanan Kanetkar. Who tore up the national flag? The Hindu Mahasabhites and the Hedgevar boys did all this. They have been taught to hate the Muslims in general as public enemy number one, to hate the Congress and its flag, which is pro-Muslim, to hate socialists and communists who are anti-Hinduism. They have their own flag, the Bhagwa, the symbol of Maratha supremacy. And their leader is called Rashtra Dhurin, i.e. Führer. So a struggle which we are uh, engaged in today, but which has a very long history. It goes back a hundred years. That this is what people like Senapati Bapat and Ajanan Kanitkar, for instance, were facing. Then let me come to uh, the aspect of institutional change. <clears throat> now, in institutional change, you look at what um, the changes which were brought about uh, before independence and even on, on the morrow of independence. In um, Madras, for instance, when the Congress government comes to power in 1937, it enacts an Agricultural Debt Relief Act in 1938. Now, under this Debt Relief Act, interest till 1931 or 32 was uh, uh, derecognized. That is, uh, farmers were given relief on that. And this relief continue, continued for five years. And a cap was put on interest to about, I'm um, speaking from memory, I think it was about 6.5%. Then, uh, soon after independence, once the colonial context had gone, Zamitari was abolished in UP. And I remember a recent lecture, not recent, but maybe a couple of years back, by Irfan Habib, <clears throat> that if such a land reform were to be carried out even today in South Africa, for instance, it would bring about a it would involve a major revolution. So uh, these are things we can relate to, and even subsequently, it is a fact that uh, the, the land reform that was carried out in the fifties late 50s and the early 60s, and then the last round of land reforms that was carried out in the early 70s, 71 and 72 under Indira. These were pretty severe and hard <coughs> land reforms. They failed in some places. I mean, certainly they failed in, and to understand they failed in Bihar largely, but uh, these are not, um, these were not uh, legislation uh, which we cannot relate to. In fact, uh, uh, I, I have uh, um, uh, sometimes I ask uh, my colleagues that when the socialists were in power as part of coalitions or otherwise in, in various North Indian states, did they carry out a single land reform legislation of their own? Or if not, did they at least make an effort to plug the loopholes in some of these uh, laws? As for instance, I understand that there were some loopholes in Bihar. So these are things that we need to think about and relate um, again to the tradition of the freedom movement and, uh, and what immediately followed. <clears throat> I don't say that we must not be critical of the decline in the Congress and uh, the hoodlum elements which entered the Congress uh, during or slightly before the emergency and how they uh, functioned in the 80s and thereafter. But um, I think there is a good deal uh, of the tradition in the freedom movement and in the post immediate post-independence years that we can and must relate to. 
Then I come to the whole question of uh, social change. Now, social change again goes back. Uh, M.G. Ranade was a founder member of the Indian National Congress. <clears throat> he died as a judge of the Bombay High Court. He edited the English columns of the journal Hindu Prakash from Bombay. He was devoted to the cause of social reform. Um, Gokhale took inspiration from him. Uh, Gandhi took inspiration from both Ranade and Gokhale. Uh, so these are uh, things that run, uh, this is a tradition that runs with the freedom movement. And of course we relate to it, we must relate to it. And we must not, I think, um, in recent years there has been a tendency to, for the opinion in Maharashtra to sort of form itself in certain sections around Savarkar. And uh, to the neglect of these other major figures in Maharashtra, uh, like Ranade, like Kokhle, like, uh, <coughs> Uh, Kanitkar, Senapati, Bhapat, and so on, who uh, were, uh, whose contribution uh, is immense and who have been uh, largely forgotten. And I think uh, by not looking at them, we may also have contributed to this, uh, this uh, forgetting from the public mind, you know. Uh, and it's important that certain things should not be. Uh, to uh, vanish from the public mind, because once that happens, then that uh, uh, mind gets filled up by other things. Even Tilak, uh, for instance, his, his uh, role, certain things are remembered, but certain things, his pro-working class role, for instance, <coughs> is largely eliminated from the working <coughs> from the public mind. And these are things that we have to keep uh, to the forefront. Even Lenin complimented Tilak, uh, you know, uh, for his uh, commitment or association with the working class. So um, these are things which uh, we must remember. I don't know how much more time I have. Uh, should I uh, go on? Uh, I should mention one other thing. And education you and have, you have about 10, 10 to 15 minutes right so education now education again is something which is vital it is something which dr ambedkar emphasized but well before him gopal krishna gokhale emphasized uh, 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 we must have compulsory and universal education now these are things which uh, we need to relate to then again in the freedom movement when the non-cooperation movement started in the 1920s, and even before that, there was a great emphasis on setting up national schools. And national schools were set up all over the country. For instance, in Assam, Omyo Kumar Das, the historian and educationist, he set up a national school in Tezpur. And there are any number of examples of national schools being set up. But I do not come across any public memory of this. Um, there, is, there are a few studies on uh, what happened to these schools. Uh, there, uh, unless we, uh, and certainly we need to focus on all this and uh, the, the schools that still remain today, uh, we need to uh, adopt them as part of our uh, socialist heritage because education has been a crucial element uh, in the socialist uh, um, thinking as well. And uh, Acharya Narendra Dev was associated with the basic education movement uh, in India as a whole, and specifically in UP, where he headed two committees on the subject. And both Govind Vallabh Pant and Dr. Sampurnaran gave him full credit for the work uh, that Acharya Narendra Dev had done on. Uh, basic education and primary education and UP in those two reports. So uh, <clears throat> this again, and this is crucial also from another aspect that uh, 
uh, if you look at the current rise in uh, the sectarian element in India, that is based on an estab on the establishment of a chain of schools that have been churning out and supporting the sectarian ideology. And we, on the other hand, have not focused adequately on, um, uh, on setting up, establishing schools and um, ensuring that uh, proper training is given to uh, students, uh, children, and also to public workers. So this is an aspect which we should not only relate to, but uh, we need to give special emphasis to. Uh, then there is uh, the subject of public health. Now you see in the freedom movement, there was a good deal of work related to public health. Uh, Fram Rose Jinwala, the trade unionist from Bombay, he was also devoted to the blind. He would do a lot of work on that front. We need, um, again, another freedom uh, fighter, constructive worker, leader of the constructive movement in, in uh, Western India. She set up near Surat uh, as, as an ashram for the mentally infirm. Then even a trade unionist like Shibnath Ban, <coughs> our uh, one of our founding members of the Congress Socialist Party, he was also involved with the work on uh, leprosy and among uh, and for the for the people afflicted by leprosy. Now this whole tradition of public health and focusing on issues of public health is vital to the socialist movement as well. And uh, in fact, in Britain, the entire rise of the Labour Party after the, uh, uh, in the 40s and thereafter, was linked to their emphasis on, on having a national health service. They made national health a central national issue. And perhaps we, uh, you know, when, now, for instance, in nine, from 1976, there have been, I've been seeing reports about the encephalitis uh, problem in East India, East UP and Bihar. And it's also afflicted other parts of uh, India. But I think as socialists, not enough at focused attention has been given to these issues. And uh, of course, uh, that would have, you know, strengthening the primary health network all over the country would also have equipped the country better for facing the current public health uh, crisis, which, which we face today. So uh, now then I come to the whole question of what is our responsibility today? Uh, I think <clears throat> we have now to uh, look at ourselves in a, in, in a broader framework, uh, not just as a movement that was born in 1934 or as a movement uh, that uh, raised certain issues in the 60s and so on, but we have now to uh, understand that it is possible that if the whatever, you know, after the 1969 split in the Indian National Congress, what happened was that the organizational wing of the Congress went with the Congress O. The, uh, and uh, the uh, other parliamentary wing went with Indira Gandhi. And although she did well in the elections in 1971 and 72, the split cut the roots of the, con of the Congress in the sense that <clears throat> the roots had uh, been in the constructive work movements. You know, when, uh, when Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, yes, and I must mention about Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, that he also, although we don't look upon him as a socialist, but when he went to Bilga in 1931 to address the peasants, 
One lakh peasants turned up in Punjab to hear Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan. So these are <coughs> people who were not bound down by uh, formulae or by uh, uh, <coughs> limited ideological formulations, but who performed a major transformative role <coughs> in, in various sectors of, uh, of our national life. So uh, I was talking about Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan. In 1934, he uh, referred at the Bombay session of the AICC to a tour that he had conducted in Bengal. Since he had gone from NWSP to Bengal in uh, 1934. And he came back with his impressions, which he shared at the Bombay AICC. And what he said was that when he went when he visited those subdivisions where the constructive work program had reached, like suppose there was a major Khadi program going on and the local people had, that the program had generated sufficient income to at least allow the local people to have one meal a day. There, the Congress was heard. That is, he says, we hame log sunte the. But when he went to those subdivisions where the constructive program had not reached. He says, Log humse katrate the. people would not listen to us. They would uh, sideline us. So this was the critical importance of the constructive program to the Congress, that it was the base on which everything else, all the other activities moved. So in 1969, when the Congress split and the constructive work organizations of the Congress were cut off from uh, Indira's uh, party. Indira's party was running purely on the, uh, on the thrust of her personality. And after doing well in the 71 and 72 elections, the decline started. So this is the very great importance of the constructive work program. And that is why it is exceedingly important that we should pay attention to activities on the ground, such as setting up schools and so on. And this is uh, something that uh, keeps a movement running. But the point I was, the, to return to the point that with the decline of the Congress, we have to understand that the whole legacy of this, of the freedom movement um, the mainstream freedom movement and the movement that started emerging in 1885 and defining the new India, that entire legacy devolves on the socialists of today because there is nobody else who can defend it and who can uphold it. So it's a very major responsibility and therefore we need to now come out of our, uh, come out of the shell of um, <clears throat> of just thinking of ourselves as people who are running, uh, we may be running small movements, but the legacy that has devolved upon us is is large, is very large, is is something which may even be uh, far too large for us. But still, if we are the only ones to take that burden, then we have to take it. So on that note. Uh, let me conclude. Okay, thank you, Anil Bhai. Um, it was almost uh, a, a talk, you know, for one hour. And uh, 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 thank you for gi giving us that enlightened talk. And uh, now in the remaining time, which is not very much, but we can spend about five to ten minutes. If anybody would like to make any comments, or would like to ask any question to uh, Anil Lauria ji. Uh, now it is your time. So uh, please just unmute yourself and, and ask your question if you would like to. Okay. So if, if uh, nobody has a question, then I would like to ask a question to um, to Anil Lauria ji. 
uh, I think you have very yeah. rightly said that the constructive program of uh, the socialists um, played such an important role um, in in the in the freedom movement. Um, uh, so so why is it that um, why is it that the socialists kept away from the making of the constitution? I mean, if they were playing such an important role as as conducting uh, you know fact findings and inquiries into the situation <laughs> of uh, agrarian stress and and police fighting and what not uh, why did they suddenly dissociate from uh, the constitution making exercise which uh, i see as such an important uh, you know a contribution that they could have made towards uh, making india a really uh, socialist country I agree. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, I may clarify that, um, uh, you know, Acharya Narendra Dev said yeah. that actually it is, on, we can remake the country only with the con uh, conquest of power. Yeah. So, but when the conquest of power took place, when the British left, then instead of participating in the, uh, in the construction of the new India, Ah, now I believe there is a, there is a connection. <laughs> uh, just a minute. I think we have finally got the. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. We are finally. So we are finally. Yeah. Now we can see you clearly. Uh, for the rest of the 50, 55 minutes, we were watching your ear and your your spectacles. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Please. Yeah, Anil Bhai. But uh, please unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself. You are muted. Anil Bhai, you are muted. Please unmute yourself. Yeah. Right. Yeah, now it is. I should um, clarify that what I was referring to and these constructive uh, activities and uh, all the reports, uh, they were not necessarily socialists who were doing it, but socialists were part of it. Yeah. And the constructive program, again, was not something which was a socialist program. It was a mainstream nationalist program being conducted, setting up national schools, uh, conducting these inquiries, uh, taking up um, local activities that generate some income for the people. These were nationalist activities that were taking place. Now we were, socialists were also part of it. And Acharya Narendra Dev, so far as the power question is concerned, Acharya, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you. Please go ahead. Yeah. So, so far as the question of power is concerned, Acharya Narendra was quite clear in his mind that there are certain things that can be done only once we attain power. Yeah. And but when the time came to share in the in the governance of India, mm -hmm. socialists parted company with the Congress and um, also refused to participate in the uh, Constituent Assembly. Now, these were very unfortunate uh, decisions, in, I would submit, and they, they perhaps had long-term uh, unfortunate uh, imp uh, effects. So, uh, you know, uh, but I may mention that Acharya Narendra Dev was not in favor of quitting the Congress. And I'm told uh, by Mr. Somaya that even Dr. Lohia was not in the um, in favor of uh, leaving the Congress. This was um, a decision uh, which was uh, mainly uh, Jay Prakash, uh, Jay Prakash's, you know, and his relations with Sardar Patel had deteriorated. Okay. And unfortunately, that personal relationship perhaps and there were other reasons, of course, accumulating. There was a change in the Congress constitution and so on, uh, which were given as reasons for leaving the Congress. But the practical aspect that now that the time comes to make the country with your own hands, 
at that time you part company uh, it uh, it uh, really was not something which uh, was a uh, it was not a realistic uh, decision i would say yeah but we also believe that uh, jay prakash was very close to nehru is that true well um, you know in the freedom of the kind of um, movement that we had uh, everyone was close mm. <laughs> you know so at the personal level yeah yeah uh, there was a closeness mm. while at the same time uh, there was uh, he was close enough to the extent that when when uh, time, in the oh, mid 50s oh. actually uh, Jawaharlal Nehru wanted uh, Jay Prakash to join the cabinet. Right, right. And at but at that time, ironically, Acharya ji uh, put his foot down. Oh. So it would not be, you know, socialists should not now. So uh, well, it's an unfortunate story. So uh, there are some comments in the chat box. So Rashmi is asking from Hyderabad, how can we make socialism politically relevant today? uh because she's from hyderabad and she is witnessing the municipal corporation elections there in which the heads of the uh, you know communal party are are there to campaign and and she she doesn't see socialists and the and the leftists you know um, so active um i mean you i'm sure you have read that narain modi and amit shah and, and yogi adityanath have gone for to campaign for the for the municipal corporation elections in, in hyderabad <laughs> and uh, uh then uh the other comment is that it was a uh, a uh, uh, a very learning session and uh, and they would like uh, more of such sessions and, and 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 longer and archives and in archives so uh, arshit arshit this is being recorded so this will be avail available you know to you if you want a recorded uh, you know uh, session version of this session and uh, then there is a question from venu venu why don't you ask your question sure hi anil uh, hi hi venu good to see you good to see you too uh, so basically uh, yeah so the, there are lots of interesting things threads to tease out but i'll just focus on on this transition around the making of the constitution you know and and issues around there i was wondering how you saw the role of acharya kriplani in this because he is someone who kind of i think straddled both the gandhian yeah, ecosystem and had you know what you may call socialist leanings um so how do you place him in this sort of question that you have been talking about in terms of the uh, dynamics of um constitution making the decision to quit the congress things like that well you see um so far uh, for, you know venu i've uh, been focusing at the larger stream of the movements and uh, i have therefore um not gone into individual details so much but since you asked the question about acharya ji uh, if one looks at the decision to uh, leave the congress um, when this, at that time acharya ji was congress president and um, at that time uh, acharya uh, you know one year before the socialist left the congress uh, they made some changes to their own constitution one of them was to drop the name congress from the socialist uh, from congress socialist party and if one looks at the reasoning behind this uh, it is very strange they say that the congress president advised us to drop the name congress because apparently there had been criticism that the socialists were misusing the congress and another thing that the socialists did at this session was to um, open their membership to people from outside the congress so this decision which was taken a year before uh, they actually left the congress was itself somewhat illogical because if you don't want to leave the congress then you don't open your membership to non congress 
and if you um, and then you don't change you don't drop the name congress from your uh, own name so they took some illogical decisions one of which at least they attributed to acharya ji's advice acharya uh, acharya kriplani's advice that you drop the name congress from your later on uh, the reasons which led acharya ji to acharya kriplani to go out of the congress those are different and they are not really related to uh, direct uh, issues of socialism and so on i think they had to do with his uh, relation with uh, jawarlal ji sure But, yeah yeah uh, yeah and then of course uh, we look upon him as a socialist because of the merger with the socialist leading to the you know the kisan mazdoor prajapati Um, and so on those days so uh, that's a different uh, aspect of it but really i have not looked deeply into this whole question of acharya kripalani's differences uh, qua socialism and him of course i do know that there was a report about uh, acharya ji acharya kripalani had become uh, quite uh, critical of jawaharlal uh, to the extent that uh, uh, there was a senior journalist who used to tell me that uh, at a meeting later on many years ago an opposition leader was speaking and uh, kripalani was sitting there and he turned to the another person sitting by his side and says don't trust him he's a nehruvian <laughs> so you know is <laughs> uh, but these are i think uh, not issues which concern me today because today i was looking at the uh, streams and how we should relate to the larger stream of our freedom movement given and and the fact that we should relate more and more to it because we are the only ones now left who can uh, take up this uh, can uphold this legacy possibly thank you Okay, and uh, um, um, Anil Bhai, uh, uh, although you know we are almost past uh, one hour, but you haven't even talked about the role of uh, socialists in the Quit India movement. That was such an amazing yes. time when the entire top Congress leadership was in jail, and it was virtually uh, the socialists who had to take control of the of the movement. So, can you just that, uh... since that aspect is quite well known yeah yeah uh, you know uh, in fact the quit india resolution was uh, one of the drafts of the quit india resolution is sent by uh, gandhi ji to jawaharlal ji with a covering letter saying that acharya narendra dev is with me he has seen it and liked it so uh, in fact one scholar uh, mahindru who did a uh, history of the congress socialist party many some decades ago he actually uh, said that according to him without any evidence though it was his view that acharya narendra dev was a co draftsman of the quit india resolution so uh, of course the socialists played a major role Uh, in the quit india movement and uh, large part of the burden of the running the movement was undertaken by the socialists and that is why uh, they are leaving the congress in 1948 is uh, so incongruous a decision because they had emerged as heroes in a sense yeah. of of that struggle and for them uh, nobody nobody could have suppose somebody had wanted to throw them out of the party nobody could have done it there was they were heroes and uh, for them to leave was like uh, you know uh, those apne apne pair pe kulhadi marna and in fact uh, there were so many occasions two or three occasions when gandhi ji had wanted acharya narendra dev to be president of the congress in fact this is something jawarlal ji has himself written there is a little known book of jawarlal ji is called unity of india yeah so little, uh, yeah yeah go ahead go ahead yeah there is a little known book of jawarlal ji it's called unity of india mm -hmm. and uh, there he mentions this mm -hmm. 
that uh, Gandhi ji uh, said that uh, you know after 1938 that uh, it should be um, the next Congress president should be Acharya Narendra Dev or or Jawaharlal ji himself. And Jawaharlal ji says, well, I wasn't, I didn't feel that a socialist should come in at this time. But Subhash Bose also in, uh, at this time says that uh, I would withdraw if a person like Acharya Narendra were to uh, be Congress president. So in fact, if the name of Acharya Narendra Dev had come up and been, you know, uh, that split of 1939 could also have been avoided. Uh, we are joined by uh, Anand Patwardhan and his uncle played such an important role in Satara in 42, uh, you know, uh, uh, among the three places, Balia, Midnapur and, and Satara, which were liberated. Balia was free only for three days and it was more of an accident, they say. But in Satara, there was an underground, uh, you know, I mean, uh, Achyut Patwardhan ran the government yeah. from underground for a long time. Patri Sarkar. Yeah, yeah. So that is something which Anand should talk about. No, <laughs> it's uh, it's not it's not clear because Achyutkaka never spoke to me about the forty two movement at all. He never spoke to he. By the time he's uh, he had become a Krishna Murthy follower and he thought that everything he had done in the past was nonsense, <laughs> and, and he he actually wouldn't didn't want to talk about it. But but from what I have gathered, because I tried to do some research on it. Um, Patri Sarkar was uh, the actual local leadership was uh, Nana Patil, who did you know the there was a lot of strong arm tactics. The Patri Sarkar was not exactly non-violent. They they did uh, they destroyed property. They did they they de derailed trains and that sort of thing. Uh, basically, stopping the British war effort. Uh, and uh, my uncle more or less was did work from all over the country because he was underground. He was never caught. He and Aruna Sapuli were never caught during the entire 42 movement, right till the independence. My other uncle, Rao Kaka, was, who was in the Congress, not the uh, Congress Socialist Party. He spent almost 13 years in jail, in and out. Um, but uh, yeah, so yeah, I think actually there's very little written because many of the people who should have written never did. And I'm myself looking for visual material, even pamphlets and things like that. If you have anything, I'd love to see. Um, because a lot of, I asked Gigi Parikh, and Gigi Parikh, a lot of his stuff was eaten up by termites. I asked uh, Madhulimaya's son. Uh, they had donated everything to the Nehru archives, which I don't know uh, whether under the present leadership, whether those things are preserved at all or not. Uh, all the material that's been donated to them, which they were meant to be in charge of. And I suspect that slowly they're wiping out that history. So you should get it before they do it. They might have already done it. I'm not in Delhi, so I would otherwise, but, uh, but it would be I, I don't think anybody, I've not seen visuals or uh, exhaustive sort of study of the political movement. Okay, so uh, I think uh, there is plenty of stuff to talk about, but uh, uh, we have decided to keep it only one hour long session so that it doesn't become very heavy for the viewers. But I think we will have to come back again, Anil Bhai, and, and it'll be nice if Anand Bhai. Yeah, if Anand Patwadhan can also join for the entire session. And, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> and and Venu also. Uh, because Venu, I, I have just learned that is doing uh, some study recently on Gandhi. Um, you know, before the freedom movement. Uh, so, uh, it will be very nice. At least in this form, you know, uh, there can be some recorded evidence of, of uh, the socialist movement um, before independence. So, there's a, uh, book, there's yeah. a book written by Achyut Kaka and uh, uh, the, it, it was called uh, India, the Communal Triangle, written in the yes. 30s sometime. I don't know if even that book I can't get my hands on. <laughs> yeah, I've seen that. Yeah. 
Okay. But uh, yeah, and yeah. Of course, my uh, talk today was not on the socialist movement as such, but on the um, how far back the socialist movement can trace itself prior to its own formation. Yeah. And and on to the on the question of how it should relate, how it relates and how it's in, entwined with the larger freedom. Hmm. And maybe the next time we should discuss why the Socialist Party is splinters by nature. Like <laughs> it takes it takes two Trotskyites to make a party and three to split it. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> the socialist. Yeah. So just quickly, uh, the Achyut Patrasan volume is available on archive.org if you want a soft PDF. So, archive.org? Yeah. So, yeah. Okay, great. Um, so I think uh, we will have to close this because, uh, you know, we are 10-15 um, minutes above the time, scheduled time. So thank you so much. Uh, Anil Bhai, and uh, we look forward to another session. We will schedule it and uh, and and we will uh, let people know. And uh, um, and and we, I also uh, discussed with Venu, Venu that we should have one session with him. He has done, you know, work uh, on JC Kumarappa, and and uh, he will also talk more about his recent work. So maybe uh, two weeks from now we will have Venu, and then we can come back. Uh, with Anilji, uh, you know, in about a month's time. Okay. So, uh, thank you so much, everybody who has been patiently listening. And uh, uh, we will send messages uh, for the next uh, se next uh, session. Um, if you if you want to receive messages, please join the uh, Socialist Party India Google group, uh, the address of which I have posted in the chat box. Okay. So thank you so much.